knowing that it's quite complex, but sometimes uh, uh, it is good to ex at least see a positive trend within all the difficulties uh, which mostly come on television. And I know I talk to quite a knowledgeable uh, public, so I also look forward to the many questions you might have. I'll try to concentrate on the positive trend, knowing that there are a lot of uh, complexities and problems uh, to solve. Uh, but I just want to make sure we all see that positive trend and I'm, I'm of course uh, quite willing to uh, answer to any nasty questions on the problems uh, why we might be uh, less, less uh, optimistic. But I think there's a good reason uh, to be uh, positive. But my uh, topic given to me uh, was the comprehensive uh, approach um, and the, the EUMS military uh, role within the external action service. And uh, I'll focus on that. And you had some very good speakers uh, before me. You will have one uh, just a bit later, uh, David O'Sullivan, great manager uh, in the external action service. Uh, so uh, nice uh, to, uh, to have him here as well. Um, so I'll focus completely from the military point. But I will not only talk about the military, I will look at the external action service and uh, from the military perspective. And then what is our role? To understand that, that per perspective, uh, I'd like to start with what, what is my role? And I know David Linky, my predecessor, was here uh, some time ago. He might have explained as well. Though much changed since then. Um, if I would explain uh, what, what my role is, uh, it's called the Director General EU Military Staff. And with the military staff, you could see a bit like a kind of defense staff. Uh, in some countries, when I arrived, they, uh, they present me as uh, the Chief of Defense Staff of the European Union. I like it, <laughs> but it is not true. Uh, there are 27 Chiefs of Defense, uh, and I serve them. So basically, in the EU, the, the military committee, which at this highest level is all the jobs together, who decide in consensus, and I serve them. Single nations already can ask me to prepare something for this discussion, but they have to decide on those proposals uh, in consensus. For those who know NATO, for me now the biggest difference between NATO and, and the EU is that for this first part, my, my counterpart, Jürgen Bordemann, who's the Director General of the NATO military staff, uh, he has only one chief, and that is the military committee, chaired by the chairman of the military committee. That part is the same. Second part is, I have this other head, that formerly, my boss now, since the 1st of uh, January, is the High Representative Special Vice President of the Commission, Cathy Ashton. And why is this such an important uh, difference? That in many occasions, I not write any more documents directly for the military committee, which was the case before, but we decided uh, to be comprehensive and we have all the instruments uh, for crisis management, which we normally also would have within governments under one roof, so not only the military, also with the CPCC, the, the Civilian Planning and Conduct Capability on, on operations, my civilian counterpart doing police missions, civilian monitor missions, uh, training missions for civilian whatever uh, in, the, in the security sector reform uh, arena. Uh, that was already something we developed two years ago. But with the Lisbon Treaty and the creation of the External Election Service and the mandate of the High Representative slash Vice President, she now basically is the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Defence. We can't call her that way, we say High Rep slash Vice President, but if you look what are her tasks and what does she has in her organisation, she's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Defence. And she has the mandate to coordinate all external action of the EU. Now, you heard this before because I saw the briefing of General Seren. Uh, he told you, and uh, David O'Sullivan might tell you again from his perspective because it has a lot of management complexities. From my perspective, this is great. I've been working in coalitions of the building and NATO for a long time. 
We always, as military, were the first to acknowledge we cannot solve this problem ourselves. And then we have a lot of other people telling us you cannot solve this problem yourself. Yes, we told you, we need others to do that. That is how it went for a long time. But nobody wanted to be coordinated by NATO because it was basically only military with the, with the political uh, diplomatic power, of course, as well. But you all know diplomatic, diplomatic power is based on the instruments you have behind you. And at NATO, that is only, only uh, military. So NATO, if they talk about comprehensive approach, they are always looking for others to be the civilian parts. Uh, and the civilians never want to be coordinated by NATO, and it's also not the other way around. And then you get situations like we have in, uh, in Afghanistan. Before the comprehensive approach starts, it goes very slow because you have so much discussion. In the EU, it's not the case. And I already have proof of it because we have several crises now since we started to work as external action service. And I'm absolutely positive about it. We have a crisis, we sit around the table, and the chair by Kathy Ashton, or Secretary General Vimon, uh, if she's out, and she's out a lot because she's Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, and then we sit around the table, uh, Hakan Siren and I are the only military around the table. In total, there are 28 people around the table, and they all represent instruments. It can be the geographical desk, which uh, uh, has under his uh, authority all the EU delegations, EU embassies. So diplomatic power is there. We have uh, my civilian uh, colleague who can do uh, the police training, monitor missions, etc. Uh, I can come up with uh, military options. Uh, but we also have development, 11 billion to spend on all kinds of programs around the world. Uh, we have ECHO. I'll just give you one, for me, the most simple uh, difference between NATO and EU, how it works. And then, then uh, for more complex, you, you will understand it works as well. Uh, we started to work, though not formally an external action service yet. Hydro was there, so the procedure we started work when we had a floods in Pakistan last year, August. She called the whole table around uh, uh, her and we discussed it. I came with military possibilities. Well, uh, one of the most logical was we can uh, deliver military transport to bring whatever needs to be brought to Pakistan. NATO did exactly the same. But at our table, also, Commissioner uh, Kristalina Georgieva sits and she says, well, for this kind of crisis, will we still have about a billion? I think I can decide now to use the uh, 200 million of our budget, because this is really a big disaster. Four days later, we were flying aid to Pakistan with military planes, delivered by member states, but that is how it works. I, I can only organize, plan, and coordinate member states. EU doesn't have capabilities of its own. By the way, NATO has some capabilities of its own, but the build of the capabilities of also member state uh, own. But at the NATO side, it took weeks. They, they could deliver planes, but nobody was buying the goods. At the end, uh, informally, we handed over goods bought by the Commission and gave them to NATO, and they brought it to Pakistan. Small example, I will give you one other example, Ivory Coast. Uh, very important uh, crisis was that in the beginning of the year with the civilian uh, war going on. We offered military options, uh, like uh, evacuation of EU citizens, uh, support to ECHO uh, to get the refugees out. Um, but most effective at the end were the civilian instruments, blocking visa for people to go uh, around Bagbo to go to Europe. And I think the most effective one blocked his bank accounts so he couldn't pay his mercenaries anymore. And then at the end, the French were successful in getting him out, but that's because more and more mercenaries just refused to, to fight for him. So this really is the strength of the EU. And if we talk about comprehensive approach, uh, I'm very glad as a military, though it is my first military job in the EU, to be part of this, because this will be uh, the strength to solve many more crises in the uh, in future.
uh, and be free to ask any questions. Uh, what are then the problems for me to, to be quick enough uh, related to all my security partners who have different uh, decision making uh, cycles? But if I start to explain now, I might talk to more in the beginning. Then, uh, I of course understand from an Irish perspective, you look uh, uh, to NATO in a bit different way. Uh, but I so often get the question, why do we need EU military if you already have NATO? So I'm going to tell it you, to, to you uh, uh, anyway. Uh, and for me, it is essential that we continue to have NATO. Uh, for common defense, security, uh, high intensity, uh, security and defense, they remain essential. But also I can only organize military operations for the EU thanks to NATO. Not that because of the Berlin Plus, but because they make sure we are interoperable with, within the EU and with all the, the other third parties which often deliver to us as well. Um, and we are not in the EU duplicating anything. Everything which is at a tactical technical, tactical, operational level, military, we not duplicate. Uh, but we are developing a lot of concepts and doctrines focused on the cooperation between military and civilian, because NATO doesn't have it, so that's, that's if, if I talk about policy development, it's very much about how do the military work together with all the civilian partners. So, strength, for me, better with the bottom line in uh, crisis management and the strength of the EU is the comprehensive approach to all those instruments around the term. Then, uh, the role of the military staff itself. Well, it's, it's the same as most defense staffs. I have a role for current operations and planning for new ones, but only at the political level. I have no capacity at all to do operational planning. I, can, I do not have the staff to make conceptual, concepts of operations, outlands and conduct operations. We have to activate uh, operational headquarters for that. Three options. I have a headquarter that it is empty with all the materials in, in my building. We call it the operational center. I could do, if we activate it, it will cost about uh, 90 people in total. Uh, I could run small operations up to better group plus uh, support to the better group. For all other, I have to activate a national headquarters like we do for Atalanta uh, at the moment still and what, uh, what we did for Chad uh, in Paris where Patrick Nash uh, was an excellent commander. Um, the third option is the Berlin Plus arrangement we have with NATO. Uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina we made use of it. The cheapest way to do our business because we duplicate nothing. We use the, the command control of NATO, uh, but it will never happen again, happen again because uh, the EU has the policy of all inclusiveness. All members uh, should be able to take uh, part. NATO doesn't uh, allow one in, and therefore we're always in the block. Um, and here is the weakness, by the way, of the military because we not have that capacity. With all those instruments in the EU, including my civilian uh, counterpart, but also in the Commission, they can act much more quickly and not have to wait to activate an OHU, which is a difficult political position in itself. Okay, operations one side. I'd say 80% of my time is more focused on the future capabilities. One of them is creation of new concepts, how to work with civilians. The other, and I'd say the biggest part, uh, a lot of effort goes into uh, what capabilities do we need uh, as a youth for the future? And how uh, do we get countries to work together so we get the capabilities we need? Um, let me first uh, focus on that one, because it's such a high percentage of my, uh, my time. Um, you know, several years ago, we uh, agreed upon a headline goal 2010. Many of you know about it. 
uh, it determines what is the level of ambition for the EU. We agreed on five scenarios going from the easy uh, uh, humanitarian assistance to the high level uh, peacekeeping, big peacekeeping and peace enforcing operations. An ambition up to 60,000 uh, in total, the sum of the different operations. Um, we had the last time we went through the uh, cycle of uh, this is the ambition, this is what we need, this is what countries have, so this is the shortfall. With the same process uh, you would do at home uh, if you have to define what is necessary. Well, that list was already quite long with uh, there's a short list of 10 very critical shortfalls. We couldn't agree on a new headline goal, uh, politically. Why? Because we never reached the headline. We didn't even want to evaluate it. And we know if you would try to define a new headline, and we look at the world and the interests of the EU, the ambition should go up. Reality is, uh, capabilities went down. And member states are even hesitating to, to tell me where they have cut or certainly where they will cut. Uh, and they make the national decisions anyway. It's, it's a painful uh, process. I'd say if I could make visible, and I, I now try to do it with my staff, just following the newspapers and Google to defense uh, ministries where did they decide to cut and you will see to our common embarrassment that many of our countries of the member states uh, have cut even in areas which are in the shortfall 10 priority also my country by the way but you can go around you will find it everywhere um, so i'm afraid we're in a situation where if you look at what the interests of the EU are, um, the ambition should go up, but the re reality is to went down. And uh, I make this remark also related to the speech of uh, uh, State Secretary Gates. Uh, we've got to make up our mind in Europe what it means that in the future uh, the EU might not always come to a rescue what, uh, in all those situations which I did uh, before. And if the analysis is we might have crisis where EU interest might be involved, uh, we then have to make sure we get the capabilities to, to actually just protect our own interest as EU. Difficult messages in time of uh, financial crisis and budget uh, cuts. And I, I fully understand that if uh, social security uh, is cut and, and education is cut, it's difficult to explain uh, that defense needs to go up. So, and I accept it. And we only can have strong military if we have strong economy. So our governments need to find a balance. At the same time, I just want to mention this. Um, just because it's so close to me, I go back to operations and to mention only the operation I'm going uh, and within uh, my, my 20, 25 minutes I have, I only managed them, uh, mentioned them uh, with some key uh, remarks and then feel free uh, to ask any questions about it if you want to know more. Althea in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, our only first and, and most likely last term plus operation with an executive mission still uh, to support uh, the local authorities uh, for a safe and secure environment. They have been successful in it, but more and more countries not see the use of it. We already started with a non-executive uh, mandate, so we start to train the military, and that, that is working fine. I, I guess somewhere at the end of the year we will get a decision on how to continue with this mission. Then a very good example of comprehensive approach. Uh, though historically it started different, uh, in a different way, uh, in the Horn of Africa, with piracy, because piracy, of course, everybody understands only a symptom of the of a problem which is on land. And 
we now see in the external nature service that all those key players start to work for it together and we for, for the first time have a Horn of Africa strategy and we're now working on an action plan under this Horn of Africa strategy uh, where we bring all instruments together to solve the problem of piracy uh, but also the famine and also the insecurity on land in Somalia and also the lack of capacities at the security side of all our partners in the region. And, well, Operation Atalanta is one part of that, important for our shipping, so important for our economy, but also very important in support of the World Food Program. World Food Program, all their ships are escorted by us, uh, they feed 1.3 uh, million people and it's going up because of the family to 6 million is the estimate uh, of World Food Program. I mean, that's a very good reason to count piracy as well. And, second priority, but still uh, until now as high as World Food Program, we escort all Amazon uh, shipping. And Amazon, of course, is essential to get security on the ground in Somalia in support of uh, the government we support, TFG, in Mogadishu. And the Commission does projects in Somalia and ECHO is doing humanitarian support in Somalia. So we try to have all those instruments together and, I, and this is one of the reasons that for the first time I see this comprehensive approach and the military terms we often call it campaign planning. Uh, we now call it in the EU action plan because campaign planning uh, sounds too military. But we use the technique of campaign planning to get all those instruments together very interesting and you will see it will make us more, more successful. Libya. Um, I'd like to mention because it didn't have much uh, uh, cover in, in the media. The EU and we were part of a civil mill mechanism. We took out 4,400 EU citizens with military means out of Libya. When the crisis started and before the intervention was there. Uh, of a total of 7,500 the EU citizens uh, in Libya. <coughs> then we had a lot of refugees going to Egypt and Tunisia, especially at the Tunisian border it became such a big problem that the Tunisian authorities asked support of OCHA, OCHA support goes to ECHO, uh, the, the European uh, Humanitarian Assistance Organization, and they asked us because in the beginning they didn't have enough civilian capabilities. And we only took several thousands of the ten thousands of uh, refugees out, but it was in the beginning. Uh, and I think still that was an important contribution as well. And then we had the discussion, who's going to do what? And at the end the discussion was, NATO's going to do the intervention, after the coalition started, and the embargo, and the EU would do uh, support the humanitarian assistance on request of OCHA. I'd like to explain this has been a huge political uh, game. Can you imagine where all the different countries came from in the beginning? And the EU was the only organization who decided that military, be it for humanitarian assistance and security to humanitarian assistance, was allowed and were prepared to go into Libya. And there were several uh, scenarios prepared on request of OCHA. One of them was around uh, this Rata when, when the fights were going on and we couldn't get in uh, enough uh, civilian support. At the end, the good news is the humanitarian disaster never became so big that they had to ask our support. From a professional point of view, it was maybe a bit uh, disappointing, but from uh, a humanitarian point of view, of course, that's good news. Um, we're now at the end. I expect uh, on very short notice to get decisions uh, to stop uh, with uh, that uh, operation due for uh, Libya because OCHA is not likely to make a request anymore. Uh, and the next phase uh, is completely going to be civilian dominated from the EU side. Why? Because NTC asks they, they not even want foreign boots on the ground other than some exports. So if you 
can expect some military support to the new Libyan authorities. It will be only some experts to advise in certain areas. I do not expect much more. All the other operations or missions will be civilian. By the way, my staff largely supports the civilians with medical, with CIS, etc. transport, but do that as uh, invisible as possible. We did so in Georgia, for instance, as well. Okay, um, I can always speak much uh, longer than, uh, than necessary, therefore my ADC already told me it's now time. Uh, so I'll not go into, uh, but I also did not plan to, but I only mention the topics which are currently key topics in Brussels and most likely also for you if you are in the policy making on security and defense. Uh, under the Polish presidency, of course, uh, that's the improvement of the command and control uh, capacity, CIV mil in, uh, in the EU, uh, the improvement of uh, NATO EU coordination, uh, pooling and sharing as the buzzword uh, to get more capabilities. I forgot to give one message here. You cannot pool and share if you not have it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the shortfall list is a long list, most of them, we not have it. So if we think we can pull and share and fill all the gaps, uh, we are too optimistic, but I do see a lot of possibilities to be more efficient with our money. And then maybe we can use it on those other capabilities. Then a very difficult topic, uh, the improvement of the usability of the better groups is one topic. Uh, that's going to be a very difficult one to get consensus on uh, even under the Polish presidency. I leave it there, uh, just uh, to have uh, some remarks and then open to whatever questions you have. Thank you very much.